Welcome to Snap, Crackle and Cheap Pops, the Pro Wrestling For You podcast. Here's your hosts, Daniel Terry, Chrissy Steele and Phil Woodvine. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Snap, Crackle and Cheap Pops. I am your host, Daniel Terry, uh, here with, of course, the one, the only, Filthy Woodvine and Chris Moneypenny Strawn. Oh. Hey, hey, hey. Oh. <laughs> so we've got just some weird little noises. <laughs> I, mean, that, I mean, that's all wrestling is, really, isn't it? It's me. It's, it's your boy, Chrissy Steele. There we <laughs> go. Yeah, he's never sounded more alpha. And whatever the polar opposite of alpha is, that nah, he's, he's hitting the nail on the head right there. Zeta? <laughs> yes. Catherine? <laughs> anyway, uh, so yes, today we are discussing, uh, as we have been so far this season, the history of pro wrestling for you uh, in chronological order uh, previously we discussed the humble beginnings uh, keel university of extreme mashup we are now moving on to the start of a dynasty of silverdale showdowns uh, which has some interesting names on it um obviously quick disclaimer uh, there may be of course some names we talk about that have been named in speaking out they were part of history we're talking in purely a factual they were their way um so, with that in mind, the original Silverdale showdown, Filthy, I want to kind of know what brought you to kind of this title and this kind of way of going forward of numerous showdowns? Um, I'm not going to lie to you, mate. I, it wasn't a, um, an idea to do lots of Silverdale, sh- uh, yeah, Silverdale shows. It was, we just thought we'd just do one, you know, when um, we did the first two shows, both over 18 shows. Kim had left or and it was leaving during the second one. And I couldn't run over 18 shows on me. And I wasn't a promoter at that point. I was just a wrestling manager with a bit of money. And so when we came with the idea of taking the shows to Silverdale so I could manage it, it's, it's on my doorstep. I know everywhere in Silverdale. I know every shop in Silverdale. All my family is from there. We didn't have the idea of putting on loads of shows. I think we literally just booked one show. Um, and that's why there's such a big gap between those first two shows, because we literally just wanted to just book a show and just see if it would sink or swim. So we're like, well, everyone, I mean, everyone goes down the alliteration route, whether it's first wrestling names or um, show titles. And uh, so, yeah, Civil War Showdown has got a nice little ring to it. When you kind of look at it, calling it the, the SS, probably, probably not a, a, a good uh, <laughs> a good thing, but um yeah, we, we just thought, okay, see so showdown, rolls off the tongue, let's just do it. And then once we kind of knew, you know, we had like a bit of a hit on our hands, we're like, okay, let's let, let's stick with it. Let's do more than one showdown. Fair shout, fair shout. So obviously, yeah, this one happened on the 17th of February, 2012. Oh, that's, it's, it baffles me that we're, we're, we're talking about things that were almost a decade ago. I mean, um, Try to think what was what three days before this date. You you, uh, you, you, you both you both got women. You should know this. Um. Uh, um. Um. Uh, um oh, uh, no, I remember. It's the last time I had a bath. <laughs> I feel so bad for your women folk. <laughs> no, no, I've got nothing. Uh, well. Uh, Trust, trust, see, you two are doing such a poor attempt. You're making me look like a nice person. So this this is so bad. It was Valentine's Day on February the 14th, of course. Oh, and, well, uh, I thought you meant three days ago from today. <laughs> oh, you... Me too, yeah. You pa- <laughs> no, you parent. We, we're talking about this show. So, f- yes, February the 14th is Valentine's Day. Your poor wives and girlfriends, so I'm going to say. Is it the same um, date every year? <laughs> it's like Easter, it moves a bit, doesn't it? It kind of has a bit of flex. Somehow, ladies and gents, Chris got a woman to marry him. We don't know how either. Stockholm uh, Syndrome. <laughs> but it was three days after Valentine's Day. So, um, needless to say, I mean, I, I'm pretty certain I'd... I'd uh, did I have a girlfriend at this point? I, I, was, I either had a girlfriend or always charming a girl. Um, at this point, I don't think I was with Shannon yet, but I think that was kind of oncoming. And I, I had to go out promoting this show all around Silverdale rather than charming the uh, lovely young, la- uh, young lady. 
so which didn't go down terribly well. But yeah, when, when you when you when you're wrestling, sometimes you've got to work on birthdays, Valentines, um, and anniversaries, and all that sort of stuff. But yes, Valentine's Day drinks, February the fourteenth. Put it in your calendars. I will. Uh, I will try and try and remember that for uh, for, for future years. Uh, but indeed, yes. Uh, so three days after Valentine's Day, uh, and your love of wrestling was in the air. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Smooth segue, I feel. Uh, and yeah, let's just let's just go through the card and remind us of what happened. So you you opened with a title match and closed with a title battle royale. Um, yes and no. Oh. So we, we've got to give a shout out to CageMatch.net because I'm not going to lie, I don't remember these shows all that much. I never get most of our info from CageMatch.net, so I'm yep. giving a massive, massive shout out to them. Now, occasionally, they don't. They don't put all of the info there, and I do remember sort of little uh, nuggets of information. So, yeah, the, the opener was a G. We always wanted to open with G6 matches. That was kind of what it was for. G6, high-flying, fast-paced. It's kind of what we wanted to do. So the um, the main event, rather than just doing a battle royale, I wanted to put my own spin on it. And this is where you can be too smart for your own good. So rather than just doing a battle royale, and you know, it's time-tested, uh, you know, battle royales have been a part of wrestling, since wrestling has begun, I thought, you know what we need? We need to put a little cherry on this cake. And we decided that it was going to be a final four battle royale. So when it gets down to the final four participants, it turns into a straight-up match. In, in retrospect, it wasn't a good idea. So it was like 20, so, you know, 20 or so people in the ring, gets down to the final four, and they've been battling and brawling for 10, 15 minutes. And then all of a sudden, they just stop. Two of them are fighting, and two are just sat in the corner not doing anything. Didn't, yeah, it didn't work. Not, not one of my best ideas. But. Hey, yeah, sort of like great pioneers sometimes have great learning curves. You can't yeah, all be winners. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and, you know, it's there's nothing wrong with throwing something at a wall, going, "Why don't we try this?" Because that's how things get innovated. So these things happen. These things happen. Uh, but yeah, you know, sort of like it's. Uh, so we started with it. Pro Wrestling Feud G6 division title match, uh, which was uh, Squirt, the uh, current champion, as crowned on the previous show. He was, yeah. Um, the G6 was the first championship we had. We did on yep. the second ever show that we did, it opened Jumping Jacks. It was still a trophy by this point. We didn't actually have a championship belt. Um, that took like a, a good while to kind of come through. It was still a, I think it was a 15 quid gold plated eBay trophy, and it just says small writing along the bottom, PW for you. I think it, it didn't even, was it yet pay by the letter, so it probably just said PW for you, G6. <laughs> didn't even say championship on it, I don't think. So, uh, yeah. But, mm. but yeah, uh, Squirt defeating Dean McManus. Yeah, I mean, if we kind of go with the ruling that if uh, G6 is meant to be the equivalent of your know, cruise weight, I don't think D McManus would have been under 205 pounds because he wasn't, he was a stocky guy. Like, I'm not trying to like, be horrible, like, but he was a really stocky kind of dude. Um, but I've been working with him at United Wrestling for, you know, for a good little while now and got to know him quite a bit. Really nice guy, really easy to work with. And it was, it was a really easy fix. Dean and Squirt to work together at our second ever show up in Jumping Jacks. They worked together loads at United Wrestling. So it's just an easy fix. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah nice uh, nice championship hole to start the show off. Uh, but I'm. So, God, I, was, I don't want to just chuck in there. Like, you know how, how low that ceiling is in Silverdale. Because you're in that ring and. How, how close the lights are to your head when you're kind of stunned in the middle of the ring. Squirt just managed to hit a 450. I mean, bear in mind, he's about five foot five, so it's not like it's, you know, any of us stood on the top rope. But still, hitting a 450 in the Silverdale Working Men's Club, when nobody in Silverdale in 2012 has seen a 450. They, they, just, they just haven't. You know, it's, it's old school kind of wrestling. So, yeah, no, that was pretty cool. I might, did manage to find a bit of the footage of this on our YouTube because I don't know where the my DVDs are for the show. And, yeah, a really beautiful 450. I mean, I have seen the ceiling tiles of, uh, of that venue take an occasional battering every now and then. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a real danger. We're not going to lie. Uh, but, yeah, I am more interested in the second match, though. 
uh, because yeah uh now i have to ask sort of like you know at this point obviously sort of like you know, cagebuck.net how is it listed as filthy but were you filthy or w when did you go from uh, what was it dagan deville to filthy um i think i was definitely filthy by this point i still i was filthy in bwa before i left which would have been 2010 it was dagan deville then like phil t smith and then Filthy, just for short, or Filthy Bastard for over 18 shows. So I'd, I'd have been Filthy for a couple of years at this point. Um, I was going kind of through the Russell Brand phase. If you kind of look at my attire for them shows, it was Primark suit with, I thought I looked quite dapper. Now when I look back at it, I kind of look like I was on uh, that snooker program, Big Break, with the little vests. Do the little waistcoat things. Waist, it's a waistcoat, it's not a vest. The vest yeah. is what you wear under. <laughs> um, I thought I looked pretty cool. I was like, yeah, I mean, this is clean. Russell Brand was kind of the epitome of um, being a gobby shit house. Kind of, I kind of fall into the, into that kind of pattern. And I kind of want to be like Russell Brand because he, used, he just used confidence as well as jism and any other kind of uh, liquids that, that he does. And I kind of want to be a bit Russell Brand's. Plus, obviously, the girl I was going to eventually go out with, she kind of fancied Russell Brand, so it kind of made sense to kind of go down that route. So I come, yeah, I, I own a good few waistcoats. Yeah. And now, I'm going to take a slight tangent right now. Uh, you seem to be throwing a lot of shade on waistcoats, Mr. Filthy. Um, yeah, I mean, I grew up on watching TV like Big Break, where all those snooker players wear waistcoats and they look like tosses. And I, to, the, to, to that point, I look like a tosser. I wear a waistcoat every show. You can get away with it. I can't get away with it. <laughs> like, if, like, right, no, no, answer me this, right? So, if we, if, if we go with this tangent, if Mr. Chrissy Strutt and Mr. Chrissy Steele himself, Mr. Moneypenny, if you saw Chris in a waistcoat, would he look dapper or would he look like a tosser? I don't think you could pull it off. I wear a waistcoat quite often. I've never seen you in a waistcoat. Yeah, if you were. A slight tangent on on the waistcoat tangents. If you go onto uh, Slash's live uh, Made in Stoke DVD, I am in the crowd wearing a waistcoat on that DVD. <sighs> Did Slash himself also not wear a waistcoat as part of his attire quite often with the hat? Who knows with Slash? I think he just wore the top hat and glasses, and whatever else was just stuck to him from the uh, fag smoke and questionable intake of questionable substances. <laughs> I, I'm just going to say, I think Chris will look like an absolute tosser in a waistcoat. So, I don't care. I, I'm calling it now. I've binned all my... I think I've burnt my waistcoats at one point. I didn't even want them to donate to charity or bed them. I think I've burnt them. I, I also fit into the whole, because of my job, I fit into the whole craft beer, hipster, wanker sort of thing. So, a waistcoat, jeans, and a white top. I, I fit into that sort of demographic with a beard as well. Was it comfy? Um, I... I'm going to say yes, only because we did our bit for charity and we got the dresses from the local charity shop in Silvale, I do believe. So they were quite big. I want you to paint a picture of what these dresses looked like. Um, Dan's was quite frilly and because he's quite a stocky chap. I think Scott had a bit of an issue um, trying to get the dress on him, which, which was a bit of a weird one. Um, mine, very long. It was... Black and orange, the orange was clashing with my horrendous fake tan. It's it kind of from a distance, it looked like it was just a black dress with holes in it. You could see my skin underneath. It, it was it was really, really weird. The the thing I can I have watched a bit of this back and I, I hate watching myself. I hate hearing myself. I just cringe. Now the finish to this match is um it's what's called the Chuckle Brother spot. So if we say we need a chocolate brother spot, I know exactly what that is. So I'm either holding someone in the ropes and the heel comes charging, or I'm holding a chair up by the, by the ropes and the heel grabs the face's head, charges them at me. They, they do a little switch. They go into me and I go flying. The chocolate brother, that's what we call it for short. And we did that with the, I'm there with a the chair. It kind of got me in the face a little bit because I, I didn't quite hold it to one side. I had it in front of me. Dan and Scott, both quite stocky guys. They hit me. I went flying onto the stage, to the chair, to the top of the forehead, which was fine. You know, I'm a, I'm a bit thick, so it didn't 
particularly hurt. I Dan gets pinned. I crawl into the ring. We try and beg our way out of um no, 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 like, no one here wants to see us see us in the dress. Scott, just shake our hand, be a gentleman, and go in the back and I think he said go in the back and start off. I think he said that once or twice. He goes to shake our hands, hits us with a double stun, and we're both out. He sticks us in the dresses. Now, at this point, I'm lying on the floor, and what, I saw this in the footage when I watched it back. I've got my um, face on top of my hand because I had bit through my lip with that stunner because I've never taken a stunner before. I just assumed I could take it. And as he pulled my head down, I bit through my lip. And I could just see like, bits of blood coming out. I had a really bad goatee at that point. I had a little proper little soul patch. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It fits me cool. And I was just like trying to hold my lip on because I had a bit through it. Yes, Dan, you've got good facial hair. Leave it alone. Um, yeah, not good. St stuck us in a pair of dresses and uh, yeah, good fun. Good fun. I have got one little story for you, though. Right at the start of this match, before Scotty came out, now bear in mind, this is in Silverdale. It's the first show I've ever ran in Silverdale. And I'm on the show. Stupid, like I wouldn't do that now unless I'm dressed as well as Wally. And that's only once, you know, forever kind of thing. But I was putting myself on all the shows as a manager because I've got an ego and I didn't know how to rein it in a little bit. So I had loads of my family there, loads of my mum's side of the family, and loads of my side of the family, the Woodvines and the Glovers. And this is the only show my dad has ever came to of mine. He's never been to see any other show of mine at all. No matter where it was, he's just never done it. The one that he, that he does come along to, he sees his youngest son in a dress, which is, uh, I'm sure he was proud deep down inside. <laughs> proud, but, proud of the confidence that his son was exuding of oh, uh, yeah. going through this in front of a few, a couple of hundred people. Well, it was, it was quite good. It was quite like a good two now because, I mean, it's quite a cheap show in, com in compared to the two that we did, especially compared to Kiel, which is just shy of four grand. This would have been maybe eight, nine hundred quid a grand tops. You know, it was, it was drastically cheaper. Now, all my family, the yeah, both sides of that, were down that side where the merch tables usually are. So where you're in the ring, Dan, left-hand side, all my family down there, my mum, my stepdad, my dad, my cousins, my aunties, my uncles, loads of them sort of people. And I can't help myself. I've got that many people that, that know me that have never heard me do anything on a wrestling show. So I've got a mic in my hand. I'm holding it up like, I'm, like I think I'm gangster. I hate myself so much. And I start trying to cut a promo. Now, at some point, I can hear my auntie shout, you look like a pimp. Like, cause you, like, her voice is unmistakable. My auntie Sandra, awesome, awesome lady. I just I love it a bit. She says, Oi, Phil, you look like a pimp. And without a second like, notice, went, does this make you a hoe? Oh, it was so good. Chris, stop adding your face. I just called my auntie a hoe on a family wrestling show. Yeah. But, like, I live for that noise where you say something, you can hear people suck the air out of the room and go, Oh! Is that you? Like, I love that. That, for me, is the biggest addiction in the world. Yeah, you know? I've just done that exact reaction yeah. <laughs> without, without the visual cue. So for you guys at home, I've done the exact same reaction. Like, go, yeah. on to, excuse me, go on to YouTube. It's on there. That match is there. If you can stand listening to my voice on the microphone, then TV, it's worth the 30 seconds. Because it wasn't planned. It was just something that comes out of me. When people say something, like, does that make you a hoe? And if for some reason, I touched my nose like I thought I was cool. I was like, ah, ah, got you. Don't know why. <laughs> to be fair, I was doing the sharp intake of breath, but may mainly at how he was holding and making holding the microphone like it was some kind of yeah. <laughs> I got hold it facing down for some reason. Like, I don't know ah. why. I don't know why. Dave Dave Tobacco, I think he was wrestling Scorpion at the time. He was he was booked for this show and it was meant to be cyanide versus. Uh, Scorpion, as he was known there, which I thought, you know, uh, try to do Dave a favour, you know, get him in with uh, Cyanide. Um, so Dave, Dave was a face at that point, Cyanide, a big heel, obviously a big stocky heel. Um, and I think Dave got pulled from the show from his workplace within a few days of the show, I think it was. Like, he used to work at the, the bowling on Festival Park, and they were kind of uh, synonymous with just pulling staff in. And you, you didn't get any choice in the matter. It was get in, he sacked. 
So yeah, he got pulled from the from the show, and I kind of thought, well, okay, well, I'll use these two other guys, uh, Alex Chaos, who I think he wrestles as Alex Gracie now. He might have changed his name again. I'm, I'm not too certain. And a guy called Tommy Hayden. So yeah, two guys I'd, I'd worked with at United Wrestling. I thought, okay, we haven't got a handicap match on the show. What we'll, we'll have to do it, you know. So yeah, um, Cyanide versus Alex Chaos and Tommy Hayden. This did flow into match two because when You've got me and Dan in the crowd um, after we just lost him. We're trying to show everyone our addresses. I mean, we wanted to be in the crowd so everyone could laugh and point at us. And he was side-eyed, comes out, stands behind Scott. We start going, yeah, Scott, Scott, what's that behind you? Picks him up, um, hits him with, I think it's a power bomb. Scott rolls out and that flows into the into the third match with Cyanide cutting a promo and challenging these two sort of young talents. It didn't really have a story, didn't really have a purpose, but it was cobbled together um, just to fill a gap, really, because we had in boots and didn't, didn't want Cyanide kind of go to waste. That's fair shout, fair shout. And, you know, sort of like, it's the kind of sort of like, you know, two and one that you can, you, you can envisage, sort of, you know, sort of like a very sort of like, you know, Strong guy like uh, sort of like you know hefty guy like cyanide sort of like you know taking on two small it makes makes perfect sense. Um, the next match though, I've got you know I'm I'm curious as to sort of like if this had any bearing on the booking for Silverdale Showdown two because you had the Myatt Legacy, uh, which you know still around today and still being the lovely uh, fellow upside down heads that uh, that they are. Um, I mean, can, can you talk? Can you talk like that at the minute? I said fellow. I, I, mean, lumped my, I lumped myself in there. I mean, you, you, you kind of look like Sasha Baron Cohen's the dictator at the minute. <laughs> Honestly, sort of like, you know, the barber's being closed has meant that this beard has gotten severely out of control, but I'm okay with it and I'm just letting it happen. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so uh, my legacy, Keith and Ryan, my uh, defeating uh, the Predators, Joseph Connors and Paul Mallon. Uh, obviously, Keith and Paul uh, also faced off in Silverdale Showdown 2. So I'm, I'm curious, was there any kind of storyline between these two in terms of the reason for that booking? Um, again, these were people like I, I, I trusted. I didn't have the network that I've got now. Like, say if someone pulls out on show day, it's relatively easy to fill. You know, I've, I've got, you, you kind of know your postcode, you know who's there, who's where, and all this sort of thing. I had a very, very limited network. Um, just from a couple of shows at United Wrestling, a couple of shows at BWA. And it was just a case of, I trust these guys. Uh, we, see, we seem to get on. And we'll, we'll, just, we'll just book them together. And um, I, th- yeah, there, there were BWA names. They, they were there when I was in BWA 2007, 2008. Trusted them both. They're quite old school guys, Paul Malin and Keith. And yeah, I think, because we didn't really have storylines, but we kind of wanted some. So it's just difficult to get that ball going with a storyline. I mean, once it's going, it's fine. It's just getting that initial spark to kind of get going. It is weird seeing Ryan Myers as a face, though. It's so weird. So Ryan was uh, Ryan and Keith were face at this point? Yeah, they, they, they were still um, they were, they were faces for, for a very long time. I'm not, not saying he wasn't necessarily in Keith's shadow, but he hasn't. He didn't know who he was. He just knew what to do. And I said to him, well, like, what, what's, who is Ryan Myers? Because sometimes it's better to be a who. Sometimes it's, be, it's better to be a what. You can apply that to any wrestler in the world. Sometimes it's better to be a gimmick. Like, if you look at Drill, it's better to be a what. Because Drill is so over the top people make you into a what rather than who. Because no one ever asks, why is he called Drill? They just go, oh, he's the pie guy. He's oh, he's definitely not the pie guy now because he's, he's cut up to shreds if you've seen his pictures. But you know what I mean? He's the um, puffer jacket wearing, flat cap wearing, northern bruiser, bevy weight kind of thing. He becomes a what rather than a who. And Ryan was in the same boat. He was Keith Myatt Jr. You know, he, he wrestled just like Keith. He did Keith's moves just like Keith. Um, use Keith's um, entrance music. Uh, like I've been working with that the the triple headbutt. That was me and Ryan sat outside of a pub in I think it was the Victoria, and we were just going through some moves. And I thought, well, what can we make that's you that Keith doesn't do that's Stokey? And we were going through like loads of Stokey phrases, like the cost kicker bow against the woe and all that sort of thing. Which I know if anyone listens to this that doesn't know Stokey, he even cost kicker bow against the woe sounds a bit weird, but. 
that's where we got the idea for, for Ryan's triple head board. I said, well, rather than do the Al Snow where you trap both arms and you do about 10, 10 15 quick shots, you, yeah, you always make stuff mean more. Like Ryan is very good at milking moves, milking reactions, milking um, the audience, milking the audience. That's how I say bad. But you know what I mean? That sort of thing, like he, he takes his time. He's very good at reading an audience and knowing where to take it, where not to take it. And I said, rather than doing like 10, 15 headbutts like Al Snow does, tell you what, do three, because everyone does a headbutt now. Like everyone does just that, the one slap on their arse and, and the one headbutt. How about you do three? You trap their arms for the first two, and then on the third, completely let go, and that's where you get your, your payoff. And it, I think it works really well. And we just started like building onto it from there. So within the past two, three years, Ryan might gone on leaps and bounds it's but it, it just he, it's so weird seeing ryan with a tiny bit of hair up top no beard he didn't really have, he had a bit of bum fluff he didn't really have a beard so his head didn't look like he was on upside down he kind of looked like when, when you used to go to a fair when you were a kid and you chuck those bean bags at the coconut shies that's what ryan looked like his head looked like a little coconut you chuck a bean bag at sorry ryan if you listen to this my bad <laughs> I'm not going to lie, that's not clipped and put on Twitter or Instagram. I'm very disappointed, uh, Chris. That's your, uh, t- your homework for this week. Um, but, but yeah, it's, yeah, you know, I've, I've, I've got a lot of good things to say about Ryan. And, and again, sort of like, you know, he's behind the curtain. Sort of, he is generally a lovely, lovely, lovely lad. Sort of like, you know, a lot, lot of time for him. As much as he does, you know, sort of like, like to rough me up in the ring, which... Again, oh, he's, he's... oh, <laughs> oh, don't say those words ever again. As much as he likes to rough me up in the squared circle, um, yeah, sort of is. Uh, <laughs> which I think he's the only, pretty much the only one that currently, uh, uh, only one of us that actually kind of like lays hands on me. Although Keith has started doing that alongside it, Keith, I think Keith, I think Keith's following in Ryan's footsteps and seen that and going, "Oh yeah, he's fair game." <laughs> uh-oh. I mean, uh, it, does that not just kind of like prove what, what we were just talking about? Ryan kind of coming out of the shadow to the point that Keith is now following Ryan's footsteps. He's in, he's seen some stuff that Ryan's doing. He's like, you know what? Yeah, it's quite cool. We'll give it that one. 100%. Although I have to say, sort of like, you know, Ryan, I got used to like doing it sort of like for sort of like, you know, four or five shows. And then the the one the one time when Keith did it, I almost cacked my pants. I'm not going to lie. I was like, oh God, oh God, what have I done? What have I done, Ryan? Oh, he's, like, he's, Keith. He's, oh, I love him both. I've got, I've got to, I've got to like sort of point out that when, when I kind of watch this footage back of the, of the bits of footage I can find, there's no commentary at all. Because obviously Magic Mark didn't come on board till oh maybe late 2013, maybe early 2014, somewhere in that kind of time gap. And I don't quite know exact days, but it's weird. I can't watch press if you are hearing Magic Mark. Like I really hope if you, if you listen to this back, that that's a big compliment. Yeah, it's not the, it's not the same product at all. Like Magic Mark makes those, or Mark Adams makes those uh, commentary tracks what they are, and makes the shows what they are now. Uh, yeah. I would, I'd be inclined to say it was a year after I joined, so you're talking early 2014. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the guy is an absolute legend and one of the greatest commentators on the circuit. I, I, I will say again, chipping in, as, as, as how good Mark Adams is, sort of like, you know, I miss him when he's not at the show. Sort of like, you know, some, sometimes he does like, you know, uh, you know, people who are at the shows will notice he's not there. He will do the commentary and post. Uh, but when he's not there, it, it just lacks a little something for me because when I'm able to kind of like you know sit by him and sort of like you know watch from ringside i have literally no idea what's going on i kind of know who's on the matches i kind of know sort of like you know to, to a degree which way some of the matches are going to go but i don't know anything else i make sure that i remove myself from any kind of uh any spot planning or anything from the wrestlers so i'm literally watching a live show along with the audience enjoying it with the audience with the commentary next to me from the great mark adams and when that's not there it just loses a little bit for me. It's kind of like the wrestling's still amazing, but not having that kind of like that sort of like constant hype and brilliant commentary and sort of like you know hilarity next to you. It just ju- just removes a little bit from kind of like show day for me. Sort of like when he's not there, it's like oh yes, it's pure talent enhancement more than anything. It, it makes the product better than it, is, it already is. Um, Mark has such an innate knowledge of the move set, um, the wrestlers themselves. Like he's he's the guy works wonders. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest, Dan's got the best seat in the house because, I mean, if he's 
yeah, you Dan sat there watching right up close to the ring with Mark in one ear and being able to watch the uh, watch the product. Dan, you jammy little swine, you. You're not wrong, and you know. Also, I miss him when he's not there because it means I have to do the ring bell, and that's just pressure. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. hey, anyway, um, speaking of bells, moving on, the next match um, is a singles match scheduled for one fall. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it took me a second to get that. But what? <laughs> I wonder what he means. Uh, Dan's uh, favourite wrestler. <laughs> my favourite wrestler that I had a stress after trying to sort out a hole in the uh, Silverdale wall in one of the later shows, which we'll get to later in this series. Um, Dave Rain defeating the Babyface Pitbull. So, Babyface Pitbull versus Dave Rain. So, six match cards, and it was free intermission free. And with Dave Rain uh, getting the win over Pitbull, and then Pitbull winning the Battle Royale at the end, it was just a nice way to kind of do a little um, a, a, a double down. So, match five, Dave Rain pins Pitbull. And then match six, it's the, the last two in the Battle Royale, final four bit Battle Royale. It is Pitbull and Rain, and Pitbull kind of locks him in a submission and kind of gets a bit gets a bit of uh, uh, clout kind of back from uh, from the match before. I think that's probably why we booked the battle royale that way. I could be wrong. It probably should have been down to the final two battle royale. That would have made more sense. But I bet. yeah, I mean, certainly a little bit of a kind of like mini redemption story within the same show. So yeah, it it makes sense. Um, uh, that does kind of like you know sort of like half answer well. One third answer of the question I was going to ask next. Uh, obviously, you mentioned that the battle royale was uh, battle royale followed by you know the final four kind of going down to a fatal four. Uh, was it a fatal four way or was it kind of a gauntlet kind of? Uh, I think it was like elimination. Elimination time. Yeah. Okay. Um, so who were the other two of the final four? Um, so it came down to Keith, Babyface, Pitbull, Dave Rain, and Cyanide. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the, the biggest sort of four stars of the show. Um, can't remember the order of elimination. So I've not got the footage. I, I, did, but I didn't think to keep a DVD because I'm an idiot. Um, and they're not all on YouTube. I'll find a way. I'll put, I'll put some stuff out on social media. Someone must have one of those DVDs somewhere. But yeah, it came down to those four. Then one of the other two would have got pinned. And then one of the other two got pinned. Came down to Pitbull versus Ray. Uh, and thus... End of the first Silverdale showdown, which uh, little did we uh, little did we know uh, was going to be the first of eight Silverdale showdowns. If uh, so, if you weren't planning for them to become a, a, a series at this point, yeah, um, like so we booked just this one show. We just thought you know, we didn't call it Silverdale Showdown One. We just called it Silverdale Showdown. We just thought we'll see how it goes because if it shits the bed, this this is the last straw. You know, we can't have three failed shows. In essence, and just can't afford it. You know, whether that's in money, or whether that's in uh, pride, uh, ego, all that sort of stuff. So once we'd kind of got this one under our belt, and the, the silver venue loved us, and said they'd had wrestling there before with uh, Britannia wrestling, and Britannia had broken a, a fire door or two. They didn't draw. I think they drew maybe forty people, fifty people, kind of tops. And we drew. I think it's about 120, 130, somewhere in that kind of vicinity. Nothing was broken. Um, we were really respectful, everything was cleaned up, blah, blah, blah. They said, well, do you want to book another one? We're like, hell yeah, we'll book another one. But the venue's really nice, and they book way in advance, hence why the next show isn't in until the start of August. So good, what, five, six, whatever months after. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, going to go on a slight tangent in terms of sort of like, you know, number of shows, sort of obviously two, your second, like sort of second year you did two shows, because I've literally just noticed a pattern that the second year you did two shows, the third year you did three shows, the fourth year you did four shows, the fifth year you did five shows. <laughs> I'm literally oh. looking at it now. I'm just like, oh, I'm j whether you intentionally did that or not, it was a nice little pattern that seemed to be developing. It all went so wrong. The ninth year you did two. <laughs> With Phil, there's no intention. That's just pure happenstance. Yeah, yeah, it's just not wrong. I, I'd argue, but that's that's pretty accurate. <laughs> uh, speaking of number two, obviously, you know, the first thing that stands out <laughs> about this card <laughs> um, is is two things. Uh, one, no tag matches. Now, I'm assuming, as you mentioned, sort of like at this point in your uh, blossoming promoting career, uh, your sort of network was uh, 
significantly smaller than it is now. Uh, I can also notice that the one tag pairing is actually each half in two different singles in this match. So did that have any kind of bearing on the reason for no tag? Um, yeah, I only had two tag teams, you know what I mean? I had the Predators and I had the Myers, and they'd, they'd already faced each other the show before uh, with, with the Babyfaces winning. So once the Babyfaces kind of win, you, you've not got anything. And um, with not knowing, like we kind of said earlier on in the, in the podcast, we didn't really have storylines and getting that first storyline out and get, the, get that ball rolling, that's so difficult. Once it's rolling, it's easy. It's just getting that, setting that hoop nice and early and kind of get it going. So I think it was more a case of this one. How, how did I describe this one? Like, we, we Perez and Fugit didn't have an identity yet. We were essentially United Wrestling, because that's where I'd been. United Wrestling, peppered with BWA, because that's all I knew. I was just copying what I'd seen and, and done in those two companies. We weren't what we'd kind of gone on to become with the raffle and all these other little weird little bits and pieces. Most of this was just cobbled together BWA and United Wrestling shows under a pro wrestling few banner. So didn't have any other tag teams. Um, so, okay, fine, we'll, we'll keep them all on the show. We'll just put them in singles instead. Fair play, fair play. Uh, and obviously, you know, true to form, you opened with a G6 title match. Uh, this one, a four-way. Um, yeah, funny little story with this one. Again, like, this is a decade ago. I don't, I don't remember all this. This is... It's crazy. So we knew we were going to have these four guys. Um, see Ryan Myatt in a four-way, especially as a face. Really weird. Really, really weird. So you've got the G6 champion Squirt, uh, Alex Chaos, uh, Ryan Myatt, and a guy called Shane Oldham, who I'd worked with at United Wrestling. And um, Shane and Alex, we, I was at, we at United Wrestling a couple of months before this show, and I always used to carry a cam- camera with me. I wanted to film the matches I was involved in and you know, that sort of thing. And if I knew I was going to be meeting some of the guys that I was going to have on my show, I could film some promos backstage or whatever with them. Now, we knew that these two were going to be in this four-way. And I thought, oh, okay, well, we'll film a promo while we're at, while we're at Bids. Now, have either of you two been to Bids Club? I can't say I have. I have done some gigs at Bids. I am well aware of Bids. It's a great little venue for gigs. However, for wrestling, I imagine it's a very different, different atmosphere. And it's a big fucking shithole. Let's just call it what it is, gents. It is a well, major shithole. Well, bear in mind, like, after the whole thing, that you, when you guys were there doing the wrestling thing, they had a massive refurb job. They did the place out. Um, the guy who ran the place, John, is sadly no longer with us, uh, spent a lot of time and money doing the place up. They did a wondrous job with the place. It's changed hands since then, so I don't know what it's doing now. But, I mean... Yeah. Before I started calling it a shithole, you could have told me that the guy that did it up has passed on, because now you made me look a right knob. Could we get away with that today? I, d- I, d- I, d- I doubt we could. I think no. I think the, uh, the, the, sort of like the, the, the kids and some of the families would probably get involved uh, and think, yeah, Rumble, game on! <laughs> well, that promo is on the YouTube channel, so I'll send you both a link to it after we've done this show. It's it's madness, it's, it's weird, it's lovely, but it's madness, it's great. There'd be fruit shooting calling everywhere. <laughs> and, yeah. and speaking of someone else who you can find probably quite a lot of on YouTube in the next match, uh, a current NXT UK star, uh, Joseph Connors and Scott Skyler. Yeah, it was uh, Joseph Connors with me. I, I, I was managing oh. him. I, I was about, um, that was going to be one of my other questions. Why are you not on this uh, on this thing? But it seems that sort of like you were such a bit part. I mean, you know, to be fair, with uh, against Joseph Connors, you know, I, I can't blame them for sort of like you know, going just just get rid of that trash on the side. We we'll just put his name there; it looks better. It's. I mean, yeah, I, I've got a bit of a story about Joe. I'm not. I won't tell you on this one. I'll say for it will be on the next episode because the, the year after this, I stopped managing, especially on my own shows for a while, and it was kind of because of Joseph Connors. Uh, but I'll save I'll save that story for for the next episode anyway because it, it's a bit of a good and I, I got put in my place on my own show on the you know but uh, yeah we'll, we'll save we'll save that for next time but yeah Josie Connors yeah NXT talent NXT UK talent uh, with me this is where we're trying to segue and marry up the two stories I think this is why we didn't have them in a tag team because we knew that we were going to have Dave Rain for the last show in this show and that was going to be it it was just going to be two shows for Dave Rain and. We're kind of like done with it, with his involvement 
Um, not for any bad reason, by the way, just we didn't have anything else for him, you know. But we knew we were going to have Joseph Connors, we knew we were going to have Paul Malin, so we kind of wanted to get them into the mix to start kind of blending the heavyweights and the tags up together. So we've got like um, a lot to play with. So I think that's why I kind of got paired with Joseph Connors at this point. Yeah, I think it's worth saying that like some people like will moan about like wrestlers not appearing at certain shows. You've got to think, take into consideration, guys at home listening, like storylines are the biggest thing. So we have storylines in place, especially from Phil. That's why wrestlers won't appear at every show. So if your favorite wrestler isn't at a certain show, it's because they're built into a storyline later on. We're not purposely not booking them. Just take into account that that's the reason. Yeah. Things like wrestling's a story. Sometimes it's a one show story. Sometimes it's a 10 show story. It's, you know what I mean? Like sometimes it's better to see a lot more of a talent. Sometimes it's better to see a lot less of a talent. Sting in WCW is a great example. He didn't wrestle for, what was it like a year? He'd just show up in the balcony, look down, and that'd be it. Less is more. In that case, sometimes you, you need to see people a bit more, so on and so forth. And that was just the case with Dave Rain, just two shows. And that's kind of real, all we needed from him. But uh, yeah, so Joe Connor's going up against uh, yeah, my old nemesis, uh, Scott Schuyler. I like, worked with Scott so much at United. Um, I ended up working with him year before last as well at Argos across the road from me. He was my manager at Argos, which was a bit crazy. Because um, we, we haven't seen each other for about seven, eight years at this point. And yeah, he ended up being, being my boss. And we just sit around all day in, in the back of Argos talking about wrestling until someone forced us to do some work, did a bit of work, and then go back to talking about wrestling. Indeed, indeed. And, you know, sort of like Joseph Connor, sort of like, you know, uh, did also appear on the on the previous show as, as part of the tag and sort of like, you know, you look where he's gone now. And it's, it's I, I love personally as, as, as you know, a, a fan of wrestling and an onlooker to wrestling, seeing sort of the roots of, you know, some of today's popular stars. I, I would I would almost go as far to say as you will probably find maybe less than 5% of all the wrestlers that have ever kind of air quotes, made it, that didn't start on some indie show in some indie scene and cut their teeth in a working men's club, working with sort of like, you know, Bob next door and sort of like, you know, getting a taste for it and then crafting their passion from there. And I love seeing kind of like, you know, that you can look back and see names like this and another name later on that is, you know, doing equally as well. Um, and know that sort of like, you know, they started at this level. So, you know, if there are any you know, budding wrestlers who are sort of like, you know, in training and sort of like slogging hard, thinking, you know, I'm never going to make it. Well, these guys did. It takes a hell of a lot of dedication, of passion, of, you know, learning, of taking everything on board, of, you know, sort of like, you know, creating, recreating, ripping apart, and starting again from a fresh blank. But these guys have made it. And they started in exactly the same place as probably a lot of people are now. And, yeah. You know, through- through graft, through grind, through learning, they have, you know, they're on massive brands, living their dream over in varieties of countries, wrestling for a living. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah, heaven forbid you go to a local indie show and find your next favorite wrestler. That would be the worst thing, right, guys? Like, yeah, you know, well, like we've had three people few doors. Like, we've had Tony Storm, we've had Flash Morgan. Like, they've all been through our doors. Like, we, we joke about you being a kingmaker because, like, they appear at our shows, and then... I mean, uh, Sugar's, 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 yeah, Sugar's the best one to, to mention. He appears in a silly yeah. little working men's club for, for a couple of shows. Next thing you know, he's on AEWs on Monday Night Raw. Sugar, you're welcome. <laughs> also, another lovely, lovely bloke who uh, yeah. I, you know, I hope to have a drink with one more, uh, you yeah, know, once more, sort of like, you know, when... When he's available, if he's ever available in the UK again, he, he, won't, he won't drink with us anymore. <laughs> please, please come back, Chuck. Please come back. <laughs> um, but yeah, so speaking of uh, sort of like you know of of people we've had a drink with, uh, you know, uh, Mark Morgan, uh, you know, member of the Sovereign, uh, defeating Dean McManus. Oh, see, I, have you seen Mark from this era? I think I have, and I think if. If memory serves, I want to say long blonde hair. Yeah, if, if like if, if seeing Ryan Myers as a good guy blows your mind, see Mark Morgan like this. It's it's crazy. It's kind of like 
shoulder length, luminous blonde hair, little little trunks, um, like a proper, the most, I don't want to say vanilla because that sounds bad, but yeah, the most obvious trying hard to be a, a, a baby face uh, as it's possible to be. You know what I mean? Just ticks every baby face vanilla kind of box. Um, it's mad seeing him like that. Really crazy. It's, I've got to say, sort of like, you know, from, from my point of view, sort of like, you know, and I'm sure Mark probably will either A, agree and go, yeah, fair enough, or B, have some choice words for me next time he sees me. Um, but, you know, not to draw not to draw parallels to the current super athletes, but is it fair to say that Mark Morgan was rocking a very much 90s gladiators vibe at that point? I'm going to lovingly disagree. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put gladiators, because Mark was like probably on par with being as thin as me at that point. I wouldn't make the connection with gladiators with Mark on that one. I'd, so I made a couple of little notes because obviously I knew we were going to talk about Mark. This is this is obviously Mark's debut from Pressing View, but I'd known him since 2010, some, you know, somewhere there in, in, in that gap. Now, Mark came to every person for you show up to this point. He was there at Keel, and pretty soon he was there with Jumpy Jacks. And we were good friends, but he was kind of like how Ryloid is. He was a bit of a danger to himself. Now, I don't mean that in a bad way, but you know what I mean? Just doesn't, did, he, I saw him do some dives he didn't need to do in front of 20 people in North, North Wales, and he, he landed on the floor. He did a dive. Like a swanton to the floor. This is Mark, not Rowan, by the way, um, in front of 20 people because he thought that people might enjoy it. And it's like, you don't need to do that. You don't need to die in front of 200 people. You know, it, it was crazy. And Mark was trying so hard to get people um, to love him as a face to the point that um, I, I, I caned him at a United Wrestling show. Like someone held his ropes over the top of the top. Um, rope, the top rope, and I came up behind and smashed him in the back. He said, yeah, do as hard as you can with a kendo stick. He didn't need to do that. He got pushed off a ladder at United Wrestling and fell for a table at ringside, which had a very small crash mat underneath, but we're talking a small judo mat. When you fall off a ladder onto a judo mat, that judo mat may as well not be there. Like, he was a bit reckless in that kind of that kind of vibe, and he was asking me to be on shows yeah, for the first show, the second show, the first show, the showdown, and I just didn't want him to be on it because I didn't want him to hurt himself. I didn't want to give him more chances to do anything that I didn't want him to do. Um, but by this kind, of, by this point, he was starting to kind of tone it down and bring it down a bit. He was still very high flying, but he wasn't doing dives and swantons to the solid wooden floor. Yeah, you don't want to wear a bump card before you're Mm-mm. a certain age. Exactly. I mean, yeah, I, I, I cared about him. I didn't want him to hurt himself. And by me not putting him on shows meant if, if he, did, he wouldn't hurt himself um, once more under my watch, then that's what I was going to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I do have to say, again, sort of like, you know, small note to any any budding wrestlers sort of like listening, you don't need to do the stupid shit to get noticed. You get noticed by being good in the ring by knowing how to work a crowd, and by knowing how to get a reaction by doing not as little as possible, but if you can get a reaction from the smallest thing, you want to be a winner. You don't need to, you know, go through seven tables in one match to kind of like get noticed. Yeah, yeah, the the, the crowd will, will, will cheer for it, but the crowd will cheer for a lot of other things that won't reduce your shelf life by several years. Yeah, the crowd will cheer for a great promo. Yeah. Focus on a promo and then focus on getting the the hardcore bumps. Yeah, ab- done I mean, ab- safely. absolutely. I mean, again, if you, if you watch Mark from this year compared to Mark of uh, now, again, it's like night and day. It's crazy. I mean, I, I, I would say that's sort of like probably on my list of top five matches of pro wrestling for you since I've been there. Mark Morgan's probably on two of them at least. Yeah. Uh, uh, Easily, sort of like you know, the, the one that instantly springs to mind is uh, him versus Dean Ormark, yeah, uh, which I thought was a phenomenal match. Um, I think the uh, the most recent one, sort of like you know, where he was involved with uh, the sovereign turning on Dave Del Vecchio again, I think the match itself was phenomenal. 
Uh, so, you know, but again, in none of those did he do anything like jumping off a ladder through a table or like because you don't need to. <laughs> do you know what, like, what, like, I think I was the announcer for this show. I was a heel announcer because I was the, the, obviously it was 20 people, 30 people at this crappy little sports club, North Wales for United Wrestling or WWE, Welsh Wrestling Alliance, we were called at the time. And the crowd was split in two. So the ring's in the middle of this tiny sports hall. Got half the crowd this side, half the crowd this side, maybe 20, 25 at each end. And I'm stood like down the middle looking at the ring because I'd done my announcements. I jumped out the ring just to watch the watch the action. And Mark is on top rope. I think someone's on the outside. And it's all moves. And there's like a gap. Like if they move the last second, fair enough. But there's enough of a gap that Mark didn't need to jump. Like it was like one of those awkward kind of gaps. And Mark fell in front of me, literally smack bang in front of me. And the noise of his body, it might, it'd probably be maybe, I don't know, 10 stone, 11 stone probably at this point. But the noise of him taking a bump on a solid wooden floor from the top rope, I, I have never got that noise out of my head. Like it was just a thump, one big boom. I was like, fuck, why has he done that? Like you don't, there's 40 people here. You don't need to. You really don't need to. It's cr- I, I I can still hear that noise in my head, and this was a decade ago. I mean, there's you know, there's, there's times that I kind of like see people on our shows do something like that, and kind of hear that kind of noise, and then just you know, a, f- a few weeks later, you see them kind of like you know on crutches, and you think, well, I'm I'm kind of not surprised. Please stop doing it to yourself. I'm looking at you, Ryloid. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we do want to say Ryloid is not dangerous in terms of to his opponents, anything like that. But he, he, he likes to put on a bit of a show and occasionally he's hit swanton bombs, he's landed on his ankles. And like I've seen Ryloid fall off the top rope of BWP um, to the wooden floors, you know. Um, I think Mark, was, you know, in his younger days, was kind of like a modern day Ryloid. So like the two, the two, it's crazy. It's just like they're traveling the same path. There is definitely parallels. And again, I will say sort of like, you know, while we're on the subject of Mark Morgan, I mean, I don't know what he was like then, but I know what he's like now. And I don't think I can pick many better people that have an ear for kind of like pacing. I've seen a lot of uh, lot of wrestlers, a lot, lot, lot of young amateur wrestlers, a lot of older amateur wrestlers sort of like, you know, so over the few years that I've been doing this and there's you know occasions when sort of like you know the, the crowd have dipped down and they need a little bit of something to raise back up and people are too focused on maybe what they're doing in the ring to notice what's not going on out of the ring if that makes sense yeah um, mark never has that problem sort of like you know he knows that you know he, he can he can sense that pacing and he knows that sort of like you know okay well we didn't have this planned but quick communication sort of like you know all of a sudden the crowd are picked up again or sort of like you know when they're too high he knows how to drop them down and calm them and sort of like you know create those peaks and troughs which is a skill uh and mark definitely has that skill um how long into his career from from his debut in in i say his debut with you in kind of 2012 to sort of like now at what point would you kind of say that mark morgan kind of like picked that up did he have it then is it something Um... he was still learning at the time it was he was still learning it. I mean, I think when we put him together in the Filthy Rotten Scoundrels, that's when it really ramped up because Mark was heading that in that direction. Um, obviously, we will talk to you talk about the scoundrels in a, in a couple of shows time because I don't think they don't come on board until Showdown Eight. I want to say if I've got if I've got pretty soon I've got my facts right on that one. Uh, yeah, I, I, Mark was kind of heading in that direction. He went. He used to go driving around around the UK. Like he didn't you have. A, I don't think he had a Missy's at the time. He didn't have your know, mortgages and all this sort of thing. He'd go out driving on a Friday night until he wouldn't come back till late Sunday. He'd book shows with with companies up and down the country and just go out in his car, sleep in his car, live in his car, um, do a show Friday night, try to get a Saturday afternoon one, Saturday uh, evening, Sunday afternoon. And then drive home Sunday night, and that's where he started picking up the sort of heelness and to, you know, getting rid of the, the bleach blonde hair, getting rid of the pleather tights. Fucking hated the pleather, pleather trousers, luminous yellow pleather trousers, vile. Um, and and so he'd kind of be calling himself. Me and him start getting back on board. I've got this idea for a tag, um, and obviously we'll get onto the scandals. Uh, at later date because Dave and Mark as the scoundrels was not the scoundrels we had in mind. Mark was, Dave wasn't. But we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. 
Indeed. And, you know, speaking of scoundrels, in the next match, uh, Keith Myatt and Paul Mallon. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's probably going to kill you for calling him Mallon rather than Malin, but Malin. It, 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 This is the thing, this is the thing. Before my time, I called, uh, you know, sort of like, God, God bless you, Sugar, um, <laughs> Sugar Dunkerton. I think I announced him as when uh, we first had him on a show because I was, uh, I think, uh, going through an unfortunately rough time and my hearing isn't the best at the best of times. Uh, and I completely misheard uh, what that was. Um, you know, it happens to the best of us. Was it Dunkton you were announcing him as? Yeah. Uh, first show of that year, it was the anniversary show of that year, Press Infuse from Silverdale with Bluff, and you, you kept announcing it as Sugar Dunkton. And, yeah. and I was stood there looking at you, like one eye, like one eyebrow up, like, oh, I just said that. I think I must have said it to Chris or whatever. Like, did you hear that? Did you, I, oh, we'll wait till the end, wait till the end, because yeah, I don't think he won, he didn't win that opening, yeah, that debut match. But we knew you were going to say, oh, ladies and gents, please put your hands together. And you say something to the tune of, yeah, ladies and gents, please put your hands together. Give it up. Sugar Dunkton. <laughs> That's that just little, making this up. That little puppy head tilt would sat there going, what? <laughs> yep. Any, you know, I'm, I, while, I'm, while I'm, you know, seem to be on the train of giving out advice uh, to any sort of, like, you know, aspiring <laughs> ring announcers, um, please, for oh God, I, I, I seem to think that show I kind of arrived maybe sort of like, you know, half an hour before uh, doors opened. Uh, I was unfortunately kind of like, you know, very much rushed to kind of like get there any earlier. Normally I'm there to help, you know, put the ring up. Uh, I'm there before most of the talent arrives and I'll, I'll spend time with them and kind of like, you know, get all the details. That is the way to do it. Not turning up half an hour before and very rushedly writing all your notes and getting someone's name wrong that then appears on AEW. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, just small note, I'll hold my hands up there. I definitely screwed up. So uh, if, if you're, if you're an, a, an announcer or commentator listening to this, uh, get to know, uh, learn your talent's names. Sounds basic, but yeah, do it. Always do it. Uh, but I have got to say with this, uh, with this match, though, I'm pretty certain this was Viola Vendetta's debut with us. I'm relatively certain on this one. So it would have been Paul Malin and uh, Viola Vendetta uh, versus Keith Myatt. Now, in the highlight reel video that is on the YouTube for this, because the footage of the entire show isn't on, but we've got a highlight reel, um, Keith actually throttles Violet for a, for a good couple of seconds. Like, he's throttling her up against the ring post. Like, what am I watching here? Am I, am I, am I, what's going on? Um, it's a bit of a weird one. I don't, I don't remember that show at all. So I would try to find the DVD and go back and watch it. But yeah, Keith, Keith went a bit heel mode on this show, so it's uh, throttling a, a young blonde girl. <laughs> I mean, knowing some of our letters, you know, sort of... Um... Kinks? No. Oh, sorry, I thought you were going to go down the very different route. I was going to go heel persona there, but you know. That's where I was going. I was going to say sort of like, you know, in-ring tricks and sort of like, you know, ways of getting <laughs> sort of like, you know, the heat. I can kind of vaguely understand it from a wrestling uh, it, In my defence... And I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna be in the shit in this one. <laughs> in my defense. <laughs> oh shit. Um how do we dig out to this one? Can I dig upwards? No, I can't do it. In all fairness, Anna's uh, yeah, Valor Vendetta, she's shown me some of her photo shoot pictures where she's naked apart from her gas mask. So whatever. Uh, I would assume everyone everyone's got some kind of kinks. Uh, we don't we do not judge. Um, no, hundred percent. We, we just also don't display them, you know, sort yeah. of like in the square circle. That's fair. And, and, and to be fair, the other day, Mister Chrissy Steele let on one of his kinks the other day in a message to me and Dan asking uh, gravy or jelly. Now we're not going to ask him about that. He claims it was cat food. Wait, I, wait, wait, I wait. call bullshit. No, 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 no. I have two very fussy cats at home, and they are currently going through a phase where they'll eat gravy food or jellied food. So I had to ask the missus what they were eating at a given time, because I lose track, and I sent the message to these pair of fuckers, rather than my wife. <laughs> I mean, and instead look, I got like, oh, what do you use for lube, then? I mean, in all fact, like, whatever you rub on Mrs. Strawnen, uh, we, we don't judge. Um, yeah, my, my barber, if you ever run into my barber, he used a tub of lube pack in bed once. He told me that while he's cutting my hair. I've, I've never felt more awkward in my life. I don't judge. I don't judge. <laughs> I mean, Lurpak must explain your hair sometimes, mate, so you know. I mean, 
it, it's yeah. So someone, someone called me Philly early while I was like, weird seven. Someone kept calling me Philly in work. Like, like oh, I am cheesy and spreadable. Like, oh god. Uh, yeah, they left, so, they left yeah, me alone on that one. Better than like a cow. On the subject of hair or someone else who has been on a progress review roster with lack thereof, uh, the next match uh, had one Zach Gibson uh, and Sam Bailey. Yeah, I mean, uh, I really hope Zach tells this story one time because he didn't realise how much Stokies hated Scousers and he was fine-tuning at such a such a rate. It was crazy. When it came to this, I mean, Sam Bailey, really nice guy, Um Kind of fits into that sort of drill and sugar donkton, you know, fawn over the top, dance, he just wants to have a good time, that kind of vibe. And so Zach was just the pole up into that, just a miserable scouser. Obviously, we couldn't have the crowd chanting, you scouse bastard, like we did at the, the very first show. But it was everything apart from that was aimed at Zach Gibson at this point. I think he did have he does have a bit of hair in this one, but it's it's not it's not gonna last too much longer. It, it, at this rate, 2012. So, but yeah, I feel, I feel his pain. Yeah, well, uh, I, I don't. I mean, I've got a full. But all I've got is a good set, a yeah, good head of hair. I've got nothing else going for me. Same, same. I've got my hair, nothing else. I mean, that, that's debatable. Um, you've got your cat food kinks and uh, cat food kinks. I love that. That's great. Um, but apart from that, yeah, Chris has got nothing else going for him. But this, this was a really, really good match. I've, I've got to state, if I can find the footage of this, I might try and persuade uh, Mr. Magic Mark to do some post-production for this match, because this was a really solid match. I say the, the polar opposites of each other, I think they were tagging together at, at one point. It might have been around this time, but we didn't have them as a team. And that's why they just work so good against each other, because they work so good together against other teams. But yeah, really good, good, solid match. Uh, indeed, and sort of you mentioned about sort of like you know hating scousers. Yes, is that news to you? No, no. Sort of, I thought you were going to tell us sort of like. Uh, no, no. It was. It was. Um, Zach loves working in Stoke. Once he'd cottoned on that Stoke, Stoke is hate scousers. I mean, it just never dawned on him. Ah. Um, so he just wanted more chances to kind of fine tune it because he, he did it on that opening debut show. Same with the second show, and he just really wanted to just get to grips with it and find places that, that he could do it. And, yeah, it just started, like, ramping up with it, and the rest is, is history. I mean, I, I really do hope if he does tell it in an interview, because he, he's got, got a message off him somewhere that says, you know what, that's where I found my Zach Gibson-ness, yeah, where people are taking their shoes off on show yeah, in the crowd and shouting and singing at him, that miserable Scouse kind of vibe. He's not a, a Scouse footballing fan. He learned that once he realised just how much he, being an over-the-top Scouser, he needed to be, and it was working. So he just went kind of in post and uh, learned the ways of the Scousers. I mean, I do have to say, I, I, I have learned to keep very quiet the fact that I am a Liverpool FC supporter. It generally doesn't go down well in this area. But you know, like it works, you use what you've got. He's got a very, like he ramps up his scouse accents, can't fault him. And I say, like he's, I think he's done pretty well with it. I, th I think he's done fantastic. Well, sort of like you know, amazing sort of like you know, talent. And I am uh, extremely sort of like happy to have a uh, sort of like you know, similar sort of like you know, head persona in terms of the beard and the hair. So uh, you know, all all is uh, all is good. I am. I'm. Can I, can I start announcing myself as the uh, the Zach Gibson of the announcing world? Um, I think you. you I was, was going to say you could be like the the OG Baldy Bollocks, but then that's probably Keith. Yeah, I think Keith's got all wrapped pretty well up. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> again, that's one thing with going back and watching you know, this from a decade ago. Keith hasn't changed. I saw him like last week on 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 the video chat, and keeps keeps not changed. He was. I'm pissing he was born looking 50. I mean... So it's like a Benjamin Button that got stuck. Yeah. Like, he's just not aged. He's, just, he's kind of like Gene Hunt from Life on Mars, actually, twice. He's, he's just been that age forever. That's kind of thing. Uh, of course, like, you know, to, to, to wrap up uh, Silverdale Showdown 2, uh, we had a... Uh, I suppose a, a, a revenge shot from the Battle Royale previous uh, of... The babyface pitbull against Dave Rain. Yeah, because we, we, we didn't say so we didn't have a story. 
And so I just, I think I said at the end of showdown one, Dave said, do you need me for the next one? I was like, um, yeah, I'm not going to date. But like, yeah, we didn't have any stories. And we kind of thought, okay, well, Pitbull's got no one to go against him. So we may as well do it. But then we'll bolt on the, the following story right after this one, at the end of this one. So Pitbull versus Dave Ray. Pitbull's the person for champion at this point. I'm 99% certain it was at this show that they start fighting through the crowd. A crowd member starts attacking Dave Rain. Do the, do the bit where they go through the middle of the audience, where there's, you've got five rows, then you've got the, the, the gap in that similar venue, and then the rest of the rows there. They're fighting along there, and um, the, the, there's there's a kid who had some kind of challenges. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, he had some some kind of condition that you know, was, obviously wasn't his fault or whatever, and he starts windmilling Dave Rain, and Dave, Dave's just getting hit from behind. Like, what the f- what was that? And as he turns around and realizes, and someone kind of escorts his kid back to his seat. And um, but yeah, I, I I completely forgot about that until I started thinking about this show. If he got windmilled. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was a nice it was a nice little story. So we kind of did um this match again. And right at the end of this match, because we wanted to book for the following year, because we knew we were coming back in March next year, we had I think it's must. Myself, Violet Vendetta, Joseph Connors, and Paul Mayle, and if the Predators all come running out to jump um, Babyface Pitbull. So you know, those two jump him, and Keith Myatt comes running out from the back. So it's Keith Myatt kind of, um, comes out and makes the save. So it's Pitbull and Keith versus the Predators. And that's, I think that's like one of the main events, no, the first half main event of the following show as well. So yeah, for, you know, nice little precursor to what we we're kind of going to go do for the following year. Indeed. Uh, and yeah, so that, that wraps up year two of pro wrestling for you. It sort of does. I've got a couple of little notes uh, like I, I want to give you. So if you look at the footage from Solo Showdown 1 to Solo Showdown 2, the stage was shit. We didn't have trussing. We didn't have even have my trussing. Yeah, the, the, the black trussing that I have compared to the silver stuff we ended up having and borrowing. Um, the curtain was just left open. It looks shit. If you look at Solo Showdown 1, there's a curtain. The curtain's barely pulled to. We've got like a table for some reason that's just on the stage with a black cloth, barely covering it. Don't know why we did it. It looks horrendous. It's like, oh, it's so bad. And then Solo Showdown 2, we borrowed a smoke machine from the guys at United Wrestling because we were still using United Wrestling's ring at this point. And they had a, they had a smoke machine. I was like, okay, cool. Let, let's Let's do that so we put the smoke machine on the stage and the very opening of the show the, sm- the smoke alarm for the silver ale working men's club the entire show goes off twice matt castle referee is in the ring with the announcer jenna which i'd forgot jenna was one of our announcers before she, she was wrestling for us i completely forgot about that and the smoke machine goes off you know, sets the alarm off twice so yep yeah, let's just unplug that that's not going to work for you. that's a bit of a ball ache um, but one thing, one thing I have got to uh, give a little sort of heads up and all this sort of thing. So still not showing on one. We had maybe 120 people there, there about 120, 130, so around that ballpark. Showdown two, roughly, was about 220 people. According to CageMatch.net, which I, I was amazed I even had this info, it was 222. Yeah. It was somewhere all there, the twos. Yeah, somewhere there or thereabouts. Because we know we had 200 tickets printed. They all sold, and then we had like a few sort of stragglers come in and that sort of thing. We probably are, yeah, it's probably somewhere in that kind of ballpark. Now, with people here took 222, again, that's really good for that venue. It was absolutely rammed because um, it was new to Silverdale. You know, it was the second show we'd ever had. People kind of heard about it, so I was like, oh, we'll go along to that one. Now, obviously, that's going to taper off over time. It will probably average about 180. There were there about 180 to 200 over time, and at least that was quite you know, kind of consistent. Well, I don't want people to hear you. Yeah, 222, and it dropped a little bit. It does. The more shows you do, it's no longer a, like a novelty. You're like, oh, yeah, okay, well, we might go along to it. We might not. But 222 for our fourth ever show, that's really not bad at all. Really not bad. Um, we did fall out with a wrestler turned promoter whose name I'm not going to mention. He's a bit of a prick. He saw pictures from before the show had started. So, yeah, when that sort of 
half six until seven o'clock time where say like the wrestlers wives girlfriends hopefully not both <laughs> um they come into the venue before the show is starts they get a table you know just a, you know, a few friends and family they get themselves they're, they're not paying to get in they're, they're there to be our guests now we've taken a couple of pictures because we had a really nice setup we'd started working with the trying to change some lighting just doing bits and pieces so we took a couple preset pictures and we put them online to be like yeah the calm before the storm we, we always tend to take those kind of pictures and we put them online, and because they had a couple people sat in the front row, this wrestler turned promoter said, fuck, you know, you, you've never got 200 people in that venue. You look like you've got about 10. It's like, that's before the show, you grade A balland. Like, and that was the first, like, filthy moment that came out on me because I was still a bit new to promoting, but that was the only time I've actually gone, you a dick. We knew what we drew, so, yeah. I mean, it sounds it to me like jealousy, so, <laughs> Um, you know, cl clutching at straws. Um, speaking of straws uh, and straws, uh, when we come back with the next episode, it will be looking at year three, which I believe was the uh, the entrance of the now infamous Chris Moneypenny's drawn. Indeed it was. Uh, yeah, speaking of what Phil talked about earlier with the smoke machine, we walked in with a vapor machine. So we didn't set the smoke alarms off. We were quite intelligent and had forethought. Um, this is where I joined the company and yeah, we will stay tuned to see what yeah. I thought about my first show with you guys. I mean, that's going to be a lot of fun because I, I know Chris doesn't talk too much on these first you know, couple episodes, but he's going to start like getting more, especially the you know, the first bit of the next episode because Chris wasn't a wrestling fan, so I, 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 I'm, I've never spoke to Chris about this. I've, I've got to stay. Like being told you're going to a wrestling show if you're not a wrestling fan, it's like really. Why? Yeah, I just thought it was a paid job, mate. That's all I. Yeah, that's all well, I, I, I do want to dig into that like a little bit because I've still got some of your blackouts. Um, because obviously your company that you ran at the time is called Blackout. I've got some of your um uh, extension leads with blackout written on them from from kind of like at that time. So I must have kept some of your gear. <laughs> I would like to say they were profit of me. However, the guy who ran Blackout was the guy who owned all the equipment. I was oh, just okay. there to help out. Um, I was the Dog's body like I am for you guys now. Yeah, I mean, you know your place. Get in your salad. Um, <laughs> no, but the, the, the cool thing that we're doing, obviously, episode three next time, not only do we get to dig deep into you know, Chrissy's start, we start to you know, bring in some really good lighting, some lasers. We start to really pretty up the performance, like really going, okay, we, we can get a crowd. Now we need to make it look like a show, not, not just cobbled together and an absolute state so the free the free shows that we did in 2013 we're going to cover obviously chrissy's start we're going to cover um my last uh, my well, my last show as being a manager on my own shows at that point i, I reeled my ego in we're going to tell a story that i've never told out loud i put it in paper once it's called the gingerbread jenga incident um, not many people will know this, so I am going to chuck a couple of people under the bus, so they're really going to hate me if they listen to, which they probably might not listen to, so I really don't care. But something happened backstage involving Jenga and Gingerbread, the biscuits, not my dog, um, that we're going to tell that story. We're also going to discuss myself and Mr. Strawny repairing our ring. Oh, God, what a night. I um, don't even know the Gingerbread story, so I'm looking forward to that one. Um no. Yeah, the, the ring repair. Wow. The, yeah. the, photos, the photos pop up on my timeline once you're on Facebook. I just sit there and go, Jesus Christ. Like For the for the people that saw me and you like trying to fix that ring, hastily fix that ring, they have no idea what went on before that, all the hours leading up to that. The, the, the excursions down to home base, like a, a six-stone man going through one of the boards – there is so much. There's insane. also a very interesting tale about me and Phil behind the curtain and a five-year-old kid who some kids shout something rather obscene, which we'll tell you next time. I don't, even I don't remember this. I cannot wait for the next episode. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, and speaking of, you know, people shouting obscenities, I have been Daniel Terry. Uh, thank you for joining for Snap Crapple and Cheap Pops. Uh, thank you, Filthy. Thank you, uh, Chris Moneypenny Straw. <laughs> 
it's, you, forgot, you forgot his name. Let's call it what it is. You forgot his no, name. No, no. I was debating whether I slipped the money penny in or not. And on oh, that note, oh. on, on that note, <laughs> money you, penny, money. money penny is stuck before most names. So yeah, I'll, I'll take. If you want to slip in money penny, by all means. I, I don't want that mental image. We will catch you next time. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Check out Pro Wrestling For You on all social media platforms and stream our back catalogue of shows over at pw4uondemand.co.uk.